the youth good wealth had 53 teachers and caused many improper, confusing customs to evolve in China. Before American Buddhism spreads everywhere, we should prevent this custom from taking root. For example, in Christianity, people are baptized only once. No one says you weren't baptized clean the first time, and so you should be baptized again. Telling you that you have not been baptized and that you need to do it again and again. Buddhism should also be the same. One does not need to take refuge again and again, each time making excuses. All the first time I took refuge, the Buddha probably did not know, so I'll do it the second time. If the Buddha did not know the first time, then he would not know about your taking refuge the second time either. How will we know about the third time up to the thousandth time? Why? The Buddha does not sleep all the time, and he sees when you take refuge. The Buddha is the greatly enlightened one. All you have to do is sincerely think that you want to take refuge in Buddhism, and he knows. So it is said, the link between the request and the response is inconceivable. If you say the Buddha does not know about you, you do not really believe in Buddhism and in actuality, you have not taken refuge at all. Even if you have taken refuge hundreds of millions of times, it is of no use. When you take refuge with a master, you should certainly respect him and honor the way. You should be very respectful towards your teacher. I am not telling my disciples to respect me because they already do. Rather, I am just explaining this principle for you. I do not need to tell my disciples to be more respectful. After te one takes refuge, one absolutely must remember not to take one's back on one's teacher or to show disrespect to him. Those who are not respectful to their teachers may fall into the hell. Which hell? The thousand blessed hell which is explained in the earth store Bodhisattva Sutra. Disciples who are not filial to their teachers fall into this hell. There are some people who do not follow the teachings of their teachers, but who wish to strike out on their own. These people like to follow their own inclinations and do not like to hear their teacher's instructions. Not only that, but to compensate, they slander and scold their teachers. Do not think that this is the joke. There are all kinds of beings in this world. Some will poison their teachers and use various methods to harm them. To sit in the teacher's chair is a mistake, and to play with his bow is a mistake. These acts are very dangerous, and only if the teacher tells you to use them is it permissible to do so. If you recklessly do these things, then it is a mistake. This relationship is very important and you cannot do whatever you wish because a disciple has no freedom when it comes to his teacher. You should never slander your teacher or talk about him behind his back. These kinds of actions are offenses created with the mouth. Sutra, good man, if all the Buddhas of the ten directions spoke continuously of the first commons merit and virtue, for compass as many as the fine most of dust in ineffable, the ineffable numbers of Buddha lands, those virtues could not full, fully be described. Commentary This section of Sutra says that the merit and virtue of the Buddha can never be totally explained. The text says, Good men, those of you who have taken refuge with the Triple Jewel, who have received the five precepts and who cultivate the ten good acts. I will now tell you about the first time one, the Buddha's merit and virtue. If all the Buddhas of the ten directions spoke continuously of the first comers merit and virtue for compass as many as find most of dust in ineffably ineffable numbers of Buddha lands. Fine means extremely small, as small as a dust mote which borders on emptiness. If it is something that cannot be seen with the eyes, unlike the particles in a ray of sunlight, which can be seen. 
vivify those particles which is visible is divided into seven pieces. One of the pieces is called uh, the smooth borrowing on emptiness, which cannot be seen. This kind of dust particle is called a fine mode of dust. If a Buddha of the ten directions spoke continuously, means if they spoke without ceasing for as many compass as there are fine mode, dust modes, perpetually speaking of the first commons merit and virtue, those virtues could not fully be described. There is not way to describe the merit and virtue of the Buddha. Sutra. Those wishing to perfect the doors of this merit and virtue should cultivate ten vast and great conduct and vows. Commentary. The Buddha has an immeasurable and boundless merit and virtue which cannot be fully described. Is it the case that only he possesses such merit and virtue and no one else has any? No, you will not find a prejudiced despotic doctrines within Buddhism. In Buddhism, every living being has the potential to become a Buddha. All living beings who fly, who walk on the ground, who swim in the water, all creatures who move, and all stationary living things, trees, flowers, and grasses, all can become Buddhas. Those beings born from worms, born from ants, moisture born and born by transformation, and all the rest of the twelve kinds of beings can all become Buddhas. Within Buddhism, you will not find cases where one can become a Buddha but another cannot. A Buddhism is not like some other religions in which there is a being who says, Only I am the true spirit, all others are false. It is only to be feared that you will not work hard to become a Buddha. If anyone becomes a Buddha, that Buddha is the true Buddha. There is no false Buddhas. All Buddhas are true Buddhas and all beings can become true Buddhas. It is not the case that I only can become a Buddha but you cannot. This doctrine is too narrow and where, nowhere in Buddhism you will, will you find the teaching that I am the true spirit and all others are false. What reason is there to have only one spirit? This will certainly be a solitary spirit. In Buddhism, all beings can become Buddhas. There are many, many Buddhas who were once living beings, uh, the, and the path they all took to become Buddhas is the same. Not one of them took a different path. So those wishing to perfect the Buddha's doors of his merit and virtue should cultivate the ten vast and great conduct of, and vows. If they accomplish cultivation of these ten, they will obtain the merit and virtue of the Buddha. Sutra. What are the ten? The first is to worship and respect all Buddhas. The second is to praise the first come ones. The third is to extensively cultivate making offerings. The fourth is to repent of karmic obstacles and reform. The fifth is to follow along with and rejoice in merit and virtue. The sixth is to request the turning of the Dhamma will. The seventh is to request that the Buddhas remain in the world. The eighth is to always study with the Buddhas. The ninth is to constantly accord with living beings. The tenth is to universally transfer all merit and virtue. Commentary What are these ten vast and great doors of practice? This is a question about the methods and names of these ten great vows and practices. Just what are these ten doors and how are they put into practice? The first is to worship and respect all Buddhas. To worship means to have the proper propriety. You could say that it means to show the proper etiquette towards the Buddha. Worship brings about mutual respect. If you are polite to others, then others will be polite to you. Why do we want to be polite? Because we want to be respectful to whomever we meet. Therefore, we practice worship. Worship is one of the five constant virtues. Benevolence, righteousness, 
propriety, also translated as worship, rites, and ritual, wisdom, and faith. People differ from animals because of propriety. If we are lacking in propriety, we are no different from animals. When we are respectful to someone, we must have proper comportment. And when respecting the Buddha, we should be even more attentive to proper comportment. We should have proper comportment and be respectful. In the past, the Chinese people did not like to bow to the Buddha, somewhat like Americans of today. When I came to the United States, people told me that it really goes against the nature of Americans to bow to the Buddha. I replied, good. If they dislike bowing, then I will definitely want them to bow. If they don't, I will teach them. If you want to study Buddhism with me, you must bow. If you do not, then I will not teach you. Why? Because you do not have the proper attitude and comportment towards the Buddha. Without that, how could I teach you? The Chinese were this way in the past too. Believing in the Buddha is one thing, but not bowing to the Buddha is comparable to being a monkey. Monkeys do not understand with about bowing to the Buddha, and if you tell them bow, they will not do it. Horses and cattle do not know about bowing to the Buddha either. They may be respectful to the Buddha in their minds, but they do not know how to bow. Chinese people were the same way. They believed but did not worship. They did not bow to the Buddha even though they believed in him. Ratnamati Bodhisattva 500 AD saw this situation and thought, What use is it to believe in the Buddha yet not bow to him? Thereupon, he went to China to establish and teach seven types of worship and seven ways to bow to the Buddha. He went to China to instruct and transform the people there and to lead them to bow to the Buddha. Wherever Buddhism goes, the response is generally the same. When it was first taken to China, the Chinese did not like to bow to the Buddha either. Why did they not like to bow? Because in the past they never bowed, and they had a mark of the self which is a kind of arrogance which caused them to consider themselves as being larger than Sumeru. If they were more magnificent than Mount Sumeru, how could they bow to the Buddha? So, in the Buddha hall, er when everyone is bowing, some people stand like a hunk of wood and some sit there like stones. Everyone acts in a different way, but those who believe in the Buddha must bow to the Buddha. If you do not bow, how can you insist that you believe? So you must bow to the Buddha images. There are those who think that because Buddha images can are carved from wood, there is no use in bowing to them. Do not mistakenly think that a Buddha image is actually a Buddha. The Buddha pervades everywhere. The Buddha's Dharma body is omnipresent. omnipresent. A Buddha image is only a symbol of the Buddha and nothing more. For example, each country in the world has its own La flag, and the citizens of each country perform something like a pleasure of allegiance to their flag. Even though flags are just made out of a piece of cloth or pieces of cloth sewn together, they represent the country. We perform our, flag, our pledge of allegiance to the flag as a way of embodying our respect for our country. Showing respect to an image of a Buddha works the same way. The symbolic images of the Buddhas are definitely not the Buddhas, and so why do we bow to them? The fact that the Buddha pervades everywhere suggests that we should bow to all the four directions and the eight points on the compass, but that is impractical. What is needed is something to which one can return and rely. A symbol is needed to represent the Buddha. You do not run off to all the different provinces and countries to show your respect to the country. This would not be practical. So a flag is considered sufficient as an object of respect. Bowing to the Buddha works the same way. 
There are seven different ways that people bow to the Buddha. The first is arrogant bowing and describes a person who, although he or she bows to the Buddha, still has a mark of self. When someone like this bows to the Buddha, it is forced and is accompanied by thoughts like this. What I am doing bowing to the Buddha? Why do I have to bow to him? A person like this becomes annoyed at being forced to put his head down. He sees everyone else bowing and feels that if he does not bow along with them, he will stand out. So out of embarrassment, he bows to the Buddha. Although he bows, his mark of self is still not empty. On the contrary, he is filled with arrogance. This describes the first kind of bowing, which is called arrogant bowing. The second kind of bowing is called seeking for fame. This category describes someone who hears others praising or cultivator saying, that person bows often and really cultivates vigorously. He bows to the Buddhas, he bows to the Sutras, and he bows to he bows repentance ceremonies. He is truly a diligent cultivator. Upon hearing the praise of this cultivator, he also wishes to be recognized as a cultivator. So he begins vigorously bowing to the Buddha. And although he finds pleasure in bowing, he does not truly bow to the Buddha. He is bowing for recognition. He is seeking recognition as a cultivator, and the pleasure he finds is in that recognition. And his dreams of fame. It is the category of bowing called seeking for fame. With the first arrogant bowing, you see others bowing, so you bow along, but you think to yourself, oh, this is really super superstitious. Of what possible use could it be? The second seeking for fame is not performed because you believe or do not believe. You bow because you see someone else bowing and receiving offerings respect and others praise. Since you too wish to receive our offerings, respect and praise, you bow to the Buddha. The third is called bowing with the body and mind concurring. What does this mean? He describes a person who bows when he sees others bowing. Both his body and mind go along with what everyone else is doing in mindless imitation without the slightest concern as to whether bowing to the Buddha is beneficial or not, or whether it is reasonable or superstitious. You do not seek for recognition. You just follow along with everyone else, your body and mind concurring. This kind of bowing has no real benefits and no real faults. The fourth kind of bowing is called wise and pure. Wise refers to the function of wisdom, and pure refers to the development of purity. It describes the one who uses true wisdom to purify his body and mind. People who are wise use their method to bow to the Buddha, and by doing so, he purifies the three commas of body, mouth, and mind. When someone uses this fourth method to bow to the Buddha, his body karma is correct. Inasmuch as he does not kill, still commit sexual misconduct, and so in this way his body karma is purified. When he uses this method to bow to the Buddha, he entertains no thoughts of greed, hatred, or stupidity, but rather possesses the wisdom born from single mindedly and respectfully bowing to the Buddha, and so the karma of mind also becomes pure. When someone bows to the Buddha, he also recites the Buddha's name, and by doing so, or by holding and reciting sutras and mantras, his mouth karma is also correct and devoid of any harsh speech, false speech, irresponsible speech, or duplicity, and is thereby purified. When the three karmas of body, mouth, and mind are pure, this is called wise and pure bowing, with which one uses true wisdom to bow to the Buddha. The fifth kind of bowing is called pervading everywhere throughout the Dharma realm. What does this mean? It describes one who, when bowing, contemplates, although I have not yet become a Buddha in body, 
my mind's nature fills the Dharma realm. And so I bow before this one Buddha. I bow everywhere before all Buddhas. I am not just bowing before one Buddha. My transformation bodies bow before each Buddha, simultaneously making offerings to all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Consider that everything is made from the mind alone. And so one's mind totally pervades the Dharma realm. One's bowing, uh, one's bowing practice totally pervades the Dharma realm. What is the Dharma realm? All of the three thousand great thousand worlds are contained within it. In fact, nothing is outside of the Dharma realm. With this kind of bowing, you contemplate your respectful bowing as it totally pervades the Dharma realm. This bowing is called pervading everywhere throughout the Dharma realm. The sixth is called sincerely cultivating proper contemplation. One who cultivates proper contemplation is one who concentrates his mind and contemplates bowing to the Buddha. Bowing to the Buddha is bowing to the Buddhas of the Dharma realm. Bowing to the Buddhas of the Dharma realm is just bowing to one Buddha. This is because all Buddhas of the ten directions and the three buildings of time share one Dharma body in common and all Buddhas countries and ways are identical. A concentrated mind must be used to bow to the Buddha, to contemplate the Buddha and to cultivate so that you will not have false thoughts. It is not considered to be proper contemplation if when you are bowing, your mind runs off to the movies or to the racetrack or goes off hunting or to a dance hall, a bar or a restaurant. You do not need to purchase a ticket for your mind to travel off in all directions with no travel arrangements at all. Suddenly it is in the heavens and suddenly it is on the earth. Sometimes your mind will fly off to New York and then for no apparent reason it comes back to San Francisco. You think, oh I was here bowing to the Buddha and then I went to New York only to fly back to San Francisco again. This must be a spiritual power. Now in fact this is not even a ghostly power, let alone a spiritual power. It is nothing more than false thinking and is called Devon contemplation of or improper contemplation. If you cultivate with proper contemplation, then you will not have these false thoughts. You would bow to the Buddha with one mind which is not divided. Sincerely cultivating means that when you bow once, it surpasses bowing one million bows made by someone who bows while false thinking. So in cultivating, when you reach the gate, then you enter. You should understand this Dharma door because if you do not, then when you see others bowing to the Buddha, you will not bow the way that they do, but instead will think, Oh, as soon as I am finished bowing, I am going to have a cup of coffee or perhaps I'll have a drink. People like this have no control over their minds and after they have finished bowing, they run off to have a drink. The problem is that not only do they themselves go out to drink, but they drag everyone else out with them. This is really pitiful. This is not cultivating purely with the proper contemplation, but it's a form of different contemplation. Because if you have false thoughts, while you are bowing, your worship is devoid of any merit and virtue.